I have another question from Senator Roth and Senator Hancock, and then I think we're getting close to concluding the hearing. Senator Roth. On the health care issue, I obviously share the concern of my colleagues about reimbursement rates, but <clears throat> in addition to having physicians receive appropriate amounts of money for the care that they provide, uh, we also have to have the physicians available to provide the care in the primary care areas and the underserved areas of the state. So I'm very, very concerned about that. I'm interested in the hearing the administration's response to uh, how to deal with growing numbers of insureds and at the same time dealing with decreasing number of primary care physicians in underserved areas available to provide the care. We have some initiatives on um, increasing the number of residency programs in the state, so I look forward with state money. So I look forward to working with you, Ms. Bosler, and the uh, administration on those issues. I realize this school district reserve fund is a small issue, and I hate to go back to it, but I wanted to go back to it briefly because every time I listen to the explanation by the Department of Finance, not you, Ms. Bosler, but your um, uh, deputies, um, I get the impression that I'm being told, don't worry about it because it may not happen, and if it happens, it won't happen for a few years. And I'm not sure that's the appropriate response that state government should take when we create something that has a problem and we don't fix it. We simply wait for a few years till something happens. Um, you know, in the military, we used to talk about proportionality of response. So I guess to get to the question, is it true that when we hit the point where a deposit has to be made into the Prop 98 Reserve Fund, let's say of $500 million, there's no relationship between the dollar amount of that deposit and the amount of money that's swept from the district reserve funds or required to be spent down? In other words, the state deposits $500 million into the Prop 98 Reserve Fund and the school districts in the state are either to sweep $2.5 billion worth of reserve funds or required to spend down 2.5 reserve funds, and if so, to what end? That, it, that is correct, that it does not um, have a proportionality. And I don't want you to walk away with the impression that we don't think this is a major issue that we continue to work with the local groups on, because we do. We do think it's, we have heard the cries and we are actively working uh, with the school districts um, to, uh, to think about ways to change uh, the provision. Um, so I don't want you to walk away thinking that, that it's not something that we think is urgent, even though it is not, we do not anticipate over the forecast period that there will be a deposit made into the Proposition 98 uh, rainy day fund. But that doesn't mean we're not uh, continuing to work on the issue. Well, that's fine, because my main concern is we're dealing with issues such as capital gain revenue and a few other things that trigger this deposit into the Prop 98 Reserve Fund. And heck, we can't even predict those events up here. How is the chief business officer at the school district in Desert Center, California, going to even come close to making the prediction and planning for the business operations of that school district? I think we're transferring a huge burden from people up here who were supposed to be able to predict and, and manage things to very small school districts throughout the state of California, and it makes it very difficult for them to plan for their normal business activities. So I appreciate your concern, Ms. Bosler. I know you are concerned, and I look forward to working with you on this issue. So thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Senator Roth. Senator Hancock. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, just a couple of things on the corrections budget. Um, I really appreciate the bipartisan interest and support in many of these ways from my colleagues. I think we all know we could be reinvesting in things in a much more positive way in our state if we could succeed in um, bringing down the prison population through rehabilitation, which means fewer victims, less crime, safer communities. But um, so we will be pursuing uh, looking at how to get data, um, both, I think, for how the counties are doing so we can see what seems to lead to successful outcomes. Um, also for our prisons, you know, every school in the state has to submit a report card on its outcomes for its young people. Uh, we should be looking, again, to see are there certain 
uh, correctional institutions that perform in more effective ways? And then how could we institute those practices? So I think our data discussion will be very interesting. Um, I do think we need to engage in a, in a positive discussion with, about the receivership. This is one where we don't hold very many cards uh, because of a situation that was created way before any of our time here. Um, but we do need some benchmarks so that we know when it's over. And we can then work toward those benchmarks and report on those benchmarks in a way that we can all understand, I think. Um, the one thing is um, the discussion of money for realignment. It, you can correct me if I'm wrong, um, Ms. Bosler or LAO. Um, I don't think we e the state ever said we were going to make counties 100% whole for every cent uh, spent on every inmate that was transferred. Um, I think the intent, as we discussed it in, in our committee when we worked on the budget, was that we did not want to reproduce the prison system county by county in California. We have the highest incarceration rate in the country, and the country has an incarceration rate that's two-thirds bigger than any other developed country in the world, um, including being about a third bigger than that of the Soviet Union. I mean, it's shocking. So we have to look at sentencing and many other things, and we have to look at rehabilitation. So um, the hope, I think, of realignment is that as the director of CSAC once said when he was the director of CDCR, counties need to take responsibility for their failures and so we can all get out in front and educate and divert and rehabilitate when we have to, which will lead to better public safety outcomes. So I think um, it's going to be a very interesting set of hearings that we're all going to have in our different committees. I would like to specifically ask for the pie chart requested by Dr. Pan. That was actually a, a very um, compelling moment for me. I think that is an absolutely correct idea. We rely on pie charts to give us an idea of the whole. And if there's a big piece of, this, of our budget or our revenue that we, do, that we put into tax expenditures, they may be all justified, but we need to know what that is. So I'm hoping that um, the LAO will be able to provide us with that pie chart, um, so, and maybe another pie chart that would just tell us what the tax expenditures are, um, because it will be very helpful in our deliberations. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Hancock, and just to put a point on your concern with the over-incarceration rates in this country, the United States has 5% of the world's population and 25% of the world's incarcerated population. That's significant. I did promise Senator Pavley I would ask a question on her behalf. And Senator, uh, I have one last question. Senator Nielsen wants to make a statement before we adjourn. This is from Senator Pavley. Her concern is attracting sufficient numbers of new teachers for classroom purposes and potentially looking at some incentives, student loan forgiveness programs and such. She makes the point that we have 50% fewer students in credentialing programs today than we did in recent years. Is this something that you're looking at? Well, in this budget, we actually um, do uh, um, outline some significant efforts to really take a much closer look at our teacher credentialing system, and especially the accreditation uh, system that we currently have. Um, and we have allocated, um, I believe, $10 million uh, uh, to this purpose in the budget year. And so teacher credentialing and teachers um, are absolutely uh, central uh, to the, the K-12 school system. and. Uh, 
and, and the training of them is something that uh, that the state uh, has oversight over and uh, we're really making sure that our system is as modern and is, a, is, a, is really turning out the best qualified teachers uh, uh, for um, our institutions. In terms of re recruitment, uh, uh, you, know, uh, uh, you know, this is, this is an issue that uh, uh, is, is very acute in some areas of the state where there's a, a very uh, um, high cost of living, um, we understand. Um, but I think that the, the beauty of the local control funding formula is really that local flexibility um, to address their local needs and what they need uh, to attract and retain uh, the best teachers uh, they can. And is it accurate that we have seen a significant drop off in the number of students who are participating in our credentialing programs? Um, yes, the you know, and that um, you know, part of that is is sort of a you know, historical artifact, but also a, a good part of it is that you know, for the last, and it's obviously changing more recently, but for a few years now, uh, school districts have not been able to hire. Class sizes have have grown. So that as that starts to reverse. You know, hopefully, you know, as as more um, openings become available in school districts, um, there'll be um, more um, more students coming through uh, teacher programs. But overall, um, certainly, the administration is is concerned about the sort of the the general trend in the reduction of of teachers entering programs. And you know, is studying ways um, or, or starting to think about ways to address the, that trend, and also in, in you know, and you know, a lot of what we're doing, you know, most immediately is ensuring that those those programs that they are recruited into are of the highest quality possible, um, and they get appropriate uh, support when they begin teaching, so that you know, this the the. Folks we have coming through programs now are, are the most successful when they get to districts, and then, then of course, we need to look at getting more and uh, higher quality applicants coming into the programs to begin with. The growing need for teachers and students to go through the credentialing program is a good piece of information that counselors could share with their students, but of course, we have the fewest number of counselors helping students make these kinds of decisions, which is a whole other concern. Uh, Mr. Taylor, I think it was about four years ago that we, through the budget process, created a local law enforcement grant program. It was about $25 million a year for three years. Does that sound familiar? I'm going to... Ms. Bossler, do you have yeah, I'm going to remind my this? staff with that one. I think Mr. Soderberg could help on talking this. about the um, the grants to uh, frontline law, law enforcement, that would be to police. Yes. That would be it. Yes. So it was created through the budget process, about twenty five dollars per year for three years. It, it was originally twenty five million in the first year. Million. In the second year, it was increased to twenty seven point three, I believe, and then last year it was increased to forty million. The budget for 15-16 um, re is requesting another $40 million to, in to increase the number of years to four. So it, this budget, your proposal, $40 million, would make it the fourth year, not the fifth year? I believe th that it would make it the fourth year, yes. That would be the fourth year. So we had a three-year deal, and what happened to that deal? You know, we talked to a lot of people um, in, in the preparation of the state budget. I think the value of this $40 million, uh, was something that was uh, uh, really uh, something that, that was very important um, to the local communities and to public safety. And so um, we proposed to continue the expenditure in the budget year. And have you had a chance to analyze this yet? We're still in the process of analyzing it, but um, we would note that in past years, the, the reason for giving the uh, funding to local law enforcement was because of the, the Great Recession and the reductions made to frontline law enforcement. So at this point, we're trying to um, assess whether or not those reductions are still in place um, and would represent uh, a reason to continue the grants 
or um, what, what the state of, of local police budgets are? Not the only area of state budget that experienced significant decrease in budget over the past number of years. And have, so can you remind us what, aside, so as to make up for cuts to help keep them somewhat whole through the recession? So we made our way through the recession, and now there's a fourth year. Yes, and there, um, you know, there, uh, it's, it is also in reflecting uh, that realignment was a big shift. Uh, many offenders that were uh, formerly in prison were are now in jails, and in some cases, um, in the communities. And so just a reflection that there are impacts on the day-to-day -day, uh, public safety uh, um, services that are required um, in, in local um, cities. So the, the $40 million was something that uh, was directly uh, provided uh, to cities uh, for, for their important work and um, in reflection of the impacts. So I would not argue that there isn't need there. It's just this is something we're going to have to talk about because... The need is great throughout the budget, and I was curious because I do remember as we raised the 25 million to 27.5 to 40 million, which was a significant jump last year, that the information we got from finance at that time was this is not only do we want to see it raised to 40 million, but this is the last year we're going to be doing this, and so I supported it with that understanding. And now here we're back again with $40 million. It's your proposal to continue this <clears throat> in years, in out years, or is this a, a last and final? This is continued as, a, as an additional one-time augmentation. Uh, this is something that because of the, pre, the, the, the precarious balance over the forecast period, there are several things um, in the budget that are one-time, um, and it's really a, a question of whether we can afford those ongoing, which is why it's proposed as one-time. I appreciate that. But, of course, the first three years was a one-time program itself. Uh, Senator Roth. Just one quick follow-up, Mr. Chair. Thank you. <clears throat> this money is typically talked, discussed in terms of police chief money. So what happens if your cities are contract cities and obtain law enforcement services from the county sheriffs? Does the money flow directly to the city or does it flow to the county sheriff? And if so, how do you make sure that the money finds its way down to the municipality that you're trying to benefit? Josh Gogger, Department of Finance. So the funding goes to one city in each county that serves as the fiduciary agent, and it's two cities for frontline law enforcement activities. So um, each city, regardless of whether or not they contract for their police services, is eligible to receive the funding, but it's um, used as more of a regional approach where all the law, law enforcement officials in that county get together and decide the best use of the funds for that area. So the law enforcement, so the county sheriff would be at the table for the cities that the county sheriff provides contract services for, and those cities that have a police chief would have a police chief at the table, but no elected city representatives from those municipalities who use contract sheriff services? Am I making sense? In other words, are we depending on the county sheriff to decide which city deserves some money? a city that the county sheriff may or may not provide contract services for? I think I'd have to get back to your staff with a little more detail on how it's working at the well, local I, level. But I would like, I would certainly ask that you take a look at it because in Western Riverside County, five out of the seven cities are contract service cities with the county sheriff. A couple of them have their own departments. So I'd like to know who specifically is making the allocation and who's representing the residents of those cities that utilize contract county sheriff services? Is it the county sheriff, or is it the city council member, or the mayor, or someone else? I'm not suggesting that it's not being allocated appropriately, but I want to just make sure, since we're talking about now, what, $130 million or so over a few years, that we get it allocated where it needs to be by the people who have the interest in seeing that it's allocated appropriately. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Good question, Senator Roth. Thank you. Senator Nielsen, you had a closing statement, I believe. A couple of observations. Uh, to this issue, it is a, what I think they're called the Community Corrections Consortia, and they're 
all the members of the local law enforcement uh, community that make these decisions. I don't think any given one dictates. Now, how they vote and how they apportion, I, I, don't, I don't recall that. Uh, I'd like to make a, a little historical point. Senator Stone pursued the questioning of, you know, has the state pushed back with all of these lawsuits in the corrections area? The answer is, in the early years, dating to when the first of these lawsuits were initiated, 1992, they pushed back too hard, stonewalled, ignored. State government didn't do anything about it until the courts got very, very mad. And then I would argue that the state didn't push back hard enough. But we are where we are with that. The, uh, and the issue is, it wasn't necessarily health care, it was about overcrowding. And then it was deemed that health care was a major factor. But there were many lawsuits, not just related to health care. Valdivia, Cervantes, Coleman, Plata. I think there were two or three more that evolved since 1992. And now we're scrambling with it. As to the realignment, that is important, and I hope folks will support our bill in, in that regard. And I will argue that this local law enforcement money is critical. They have a huge problem been dumped on them, cities, police chiefs, and sheriffs, by the state of California. We've done Pontius Pilate and washed our hands of some 40,000, and now another 10,000 to come with 47. So we don't have to deal with them, but they do. And they do not have the resources to adequately deal with it. And I will argue, nor do the courts, which is a whole other issue. So we certainly have got to contend with that. It is a big challenge ahead. In terms of where we're headed with this budget, I entreat our subcommittees to exercise very rigid oversight and the concept of zero-based budgeting self-imposed in each committee. Very critical analysis, much more so than we often do of agencies' budgets. And it isn't for sufficient for agencies to come and simply say, we need more. We need to hear them say, how will we do better? And in some cases, how can we do things for less? That is a challenge of these challenging times. Mr. Chairman, I thank you for the, the indulgence uh, of the public getting this opportunity members of the committee. Thank you all folks for uh, finance and ledge analysts for doing your ever able job. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair Nielsen of the committee. Uh, I think we're off to a great bipartisan start to our budget review. I'm encouraged that of uh, talking with other colleagues that there was great interest in serving on the budget committee. So I think we all realize that we're in a privileged and responsible position in doing the work of the Budget Committee. The subcommittees will be reviewing by issue, item, uh, issue categories, line item review beginning in March. We'll work through probably a couple dozen subcommittee hearings over the next couple of months so that we can, as a full Budget Committee, craft a bipartisan budget to get to the conference committee by beginning of June, and I will make the bold statement and guarantee that this will be the fifth year consecutively that we will pass a budget balanced and on time by June 15th so that we can do the people's work and recognizing that, as Mr. Taylor always reminds us, that it's a matter of making choices and determining what our priorities are, because the budget, of course, is our major statement of our values. So thank you all for staying with us through this long hearing, and look forward to our next hearing in February. We are adjourned. Thank you, Mark. Thank you, Jim. Yeah, the next hearing, Jim.